It worked, who could resist? <laughs> who could resist that dance move, by gosh. But as if the hula skirt and the medallions of feathers dangling above his head weren't enough, what Dirkula and his team have discovered is perhaps even more remarkable. They have studied the structure of the feathers on the bird's breast. And you may have noticed that during the finale, he was shaking those shimmering feathers and they were flashing in the dim light of the rainforest understory. Well, what they have learned is that the individual barbs that make up the veins of the, those feathers are faceted just like the surface of a jewel. And each facet uh, is structured in a way that refracts uh, or diffracts light in a different way, creating a different shimmering color so that as your perspective changes on those feathers, the shimmering colors of the feathers change too, from a beautiful iridescent blue to green to burnished copper and back again. Truly, truly astounding. So the biology of feathers alone is worthy of a book. And I couldn't help but throw in the, uh, this picture here of the, uh, the great Argus pheasant, a marvelous Southeast Asian pheasant. It's hard to even find the bird in amidst all of those feathers. Uh, and I will point out, too, for I see a few familiar faces in the audience tonight, and I have thrown in a few new things since the last time you saw me do a feather talk, and I may just quiz you at the end of this, so take notes. Uh, but in doing the research for the book, it soon began to spread out beyond my familiar realm of biology and natural history into things like paleontology and mythology and even fashion. I learned that this year, 2011, marks an important year for feathers. It's filled with all kinds of feathery anniversaries. It is, for example, the sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the discovery of Archaeopteryx, a fossil famously endowed with the snout and tail of a lizard and the feathers of a bird. Now, Archaeopteryx and its famed feathers arrived at London's Natural History Museum in the heady years immediately following publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. When evolution and natural selection were the talk of the town hotly debated everywhere from the university lecture halls to the coffee houses, to the daily papers where Lar Darwin was often lampooned for his beliefs. And with its combination of clearly avian and clearly reptilian features, Archaeopteryx was like dumping gasoline on that fire. Darwin's supporters immediately embraced it as a clear sign of natural selection and evolution uh, from one group to another, while his detractors dismissed it as a fraud and a hoax now, it's 150 years and over 1,000 research papers later, but that fossil continues to be at the heart of evolutionary theory, so important that they call it biology's Rosetta Stone. And only within the last few years have people begun to unite around a theory of bird origin as more and more feathered dinosaur fossils emerge from the fossil beds of northeastern China. And those same fossils are informing our knowledge of feather origins as well. Only recently have we adopted and adapted to a new theory of feather evolution, not from scales, as was previously thought, uh, thought and was taught, I should say, in, uh, certainly was in my ornithology textbooks, not from scales, but along their own evolutionary pathway, from simple quills and bristles to the increasingly complex plumes of a modern feather. Now, 2011 marks another anniversary. It is really the centennial, if you will, of the height of what they call the plume boom. Now, a hundred years ago, every one of us would have put on a hat before leaving the house this evening and for the women in the room, the vast majority of your hats would have been elaborately feathered. So valuable were ostrich plumes to the hat and feather trade that they ranked as the most expensive cargo lost on the Titanic when it sank in 1912. Forty cases of prime ostrich plumes destined 
for the hat makers of New York. At the turn of the century, believe it or not, it is estimated that one in 20 American workers were involved in some way in the hat and feather trade. Now, in modern terms, that is more than the combined memberships of the United Auto Workers, the Longshoremen, the United Farm Workers, the Association of Flight Attendants. You can even throw in the Writers Guild of America <laughs> with plenty of room to spare. Hats and feathers were a major, major industry at the time. And opposition to that trade, particularly to its devastating impacts on wild birds like the great egret, really galvanized the first real conservation movement in America and led directly to the founding of the Audubon Society. And if you look at the logo of the Audubon Society to this day, you will see the great egret there in silhouette with its beautiful breeding plumes trailing out behind. But ostriches are something different. And the story I want to tell you is a story of ostrich espionage. Now, they were different in that ostrich plumes could be harvested without killing the bird, clipped off so that the bird would simply grow a new set of feathers and those could be harvested and sold again. And at the height of that plume boom, there was no country in the world that kept more domestic ostriches than South Africa. South African ranchers had flocks totaling more than a million birds. And they sold those feathers at great auctions where 60 distinct grades and types of ostrich feather were recognized. And incredible fortunes were made. And to this day, the mansions and other ornate buildings that dot the Karoo, the ostrich country of South Africa, are known as feather palaces, built on feather money. But the most valuable plumes of all, strangely enough, did not come from South Africa. They were a mystery. They emerged only rarely with the caravans that were crisscrossing the Sahara Desert. And no one was quite sure where the bloody things were coming from. They attributed them to a, a near mythic bird they called the Barbary Ostrich, one that had a particularly luxurious and beautiful feather, more valuable than any other in the world. And in 1911, 100 years ago, in spite of the fact that South Africa had only been a country for a few months, they felt it was worth risking an international confrontation with France, with the French Empire, for the mere chance of adding Barbary ostriches to their breeding stock. So acting on the tip from a camel driver, they launched, in 1911, the Trans-Saharan Ostrich Expedition, a grueling 10-month journey, one of history's most unlikely adventures, a grueling 10-month journey in an attempt to capture, by any means, 150 of the fabled Barbary ostriches and transport them by pen, by railroad car, and by steam liner, 3,500 miles home to Cape Town. And believe it or not, 129 of those birds survived the journey and were greeted to a, a hero's welcome on the docks of Cape Town. So for me, perhaps the most surprising aspect of the research for this book has been the depth and the breadth of the human fascination with feathers. The lengths to which people will go to wear them, to have them, to study them, and to use them in intriguing ways. The incredible diversity of form and function of feathers in nature is perhaps surpassed by the countless ways that people have co-opted feathers for their own purposes. I want to quote to you from an article, again, from 100 years ago. This is from 1911, the magazine Hunter, Trader, and Trapper. And they were encouraging their readers to get involved in this lucrative feather industry. They listed, of course, the sort of obvious demand for feathers in the fashion trade and for down, for pillows and comforters. But they also listed growing demand for other markets, including, and I quote, pens, feather bone powder puffs, trimming, boas, artificial furs, fans, jewelry sets, military and lodge plumes, fire screens, artificial flies for anglers, brushes, toothpicks, dusters, camel's hair brushes, and even, though rarely, 
parasols. <clears throat> now it's a hundred years later and, and tastes and technologies may have changed, but you still don't have to look far to find feathers. A search of the, the recent patent applications will unveil a range of promising new techniques for transforming feathers into everything from upholstery fabric to biodiesel to uh, something that would be quite useful and welcome in our household where Noah uh, recently celebrated his second birthday and that is uh, feather-based, biodegradable, disposable, highly absorbent baby diapers. <laughs> and if it's too much trouble to go shopping for feather baby diapers, all you really need to do to find feathers in the human world is tune in to the latest edition of American Idol, <laughs> where you will see rock and roll icon and American Idol judge Steven Tyler bedecked and festooned with feathers. He has them woven into his hair as hair extension. He is wearing them in, on great feathery earrings, and in doing so has helped to set off the latest feathery fashion craze. It's simply the latest manifestation of something that's been going on for thousands of years. People stealing feathers from the birds and using them for our own adornment. Now in this case, Mr. Tyler has done it to the great dismay and irritation of fly fishermen. <clears throat> because these feathers are the very same feathers that are traditionally used to tie flies. And so whereas a year ago, you could buy a full cape of, of prime rooster hackle for $100 or $150. Those same feathers would cost you more than $1,000 today, if you could even find any to buy. I have a friend who is a fly fisherman and recently told me, eh, it's just one more reason to hate American Idol. <laughs> So the extent of the cultural research for the book was a surprise to me and took me in directions I never anticipated. Now, you can imagine that for a biologist, this is a typical research trip. A typical research trip involves tropical rainforests and things like that, but I can assure you that feathers was the first time my research took me to Las Vegas, <laughs> where it was, of course, necessary to interview showgirls. <laughs> about their feathery, feathery costumes. I will add to that story that it is the last time I tried to convince my wife that that counted as a research trip. <laughs> uh, but of course, feathers took me even farther afield. I took a fly tying lesson in Eastern Oregon, visited a New York hat maker, and of course toured the largest feather and down factory in North America, which happens to be in Marysville, Washington, of all places. Now, I talked with Chinese paleontologists about their incredible discoveries. In fact, this one fellow, uh, Xu Xing is his name, uh, an amazing researcher. They call him the Indiana Jones of China because he's discovered so many new uh, dinosaur species. Uh, and his, just, they were coming out so fast in the literature, these new feathered dinosaurs he was discovering. I finally sent the guy an email and said, would you please take a vacation? I'm trying to finish chapter four. 